My name is Sam Thompson. I'm a professor here at Penn State Law. This is an introduction to class number 14 of the 14 classes offered in the spring semester of 2021 at Penn State Law in my course entitled The Lawyer's Role in Helping Close the Minority White Gap in Business Ownership. Background information on the course is given in the intro to the first session. The materials for each session, including slide presentations on the materials, are in the folder for the session on the Penn State Law website. First, let me thank all of the great professionals who have participated in this course. The names and bios of these presenters are in the folder for the session that they participated in. Let me thank those of you who have viewed the special session of this course that was held live on April 20 and is recorded uh, on our website today. The session, that session focused on perspectives from outstanding lawyers, economists, bankers, business school deans, venture capitalists, private equity investors, tax policy experts, and a husband and wife entrepreneurial team. This is our wrap-up session, and the students will make presentations on the papers they are working on for the course. The names of the students and the topics are, in alphabetical order, Alexis Costello, topic, Issues in Financing Minority Businesses. Nicole Dugan, topic, An Analysis of Facially Neutral Policies and Their Impact on the Wealth Gap. Bria Jones, Why White-Owned Businesses Are More Successful, Steps to Enhance Black-Owned Business and the Impact on the Economy. Sydney McDonough, An Analysis of How Intellectual Property Law Contributes to the Wealth Gap Between White and Minority Businesses. Skylar Morgan, Equity-Based Funding for Minority-Owned Businesses. And finally, Brittany Peterson, Proposal for Minority Business Accelerator at Penn State. Uh, all of these students did an amazing job. Uh, you may have recognized that all of them are females. This is the first all-female class that I've ever had in my long teaching career, and it has been a joy to work with all of them, and I want to thank them for their, their efforts. Each is going to be an absolutely spectacular uh, lawyer. The slides used in the presentation are available on the website. At the end of these presentations, I will make a brief presentation on an idea I first expressed 50 years ago in my paper for a minority business development course taught by Professor Munheim at the Penn Law School. Uh, Professor Munheim participated in our April 20. Uh, program. My paper was entitled Black Ownership, an Analysis, and a Proposal. The paper was serialized in four issues of the Black Business Digest, which is no longer published. In this brief presentation, I speak about my 1971 proposal to have black churches fund through par parishioner contributions and otherwise uh, organize the What's what I refer to as the National Development Corporation and the National Development Bank. And both the corporation and the bank would be devoted to assisting in the development of minority-owned businesses. I am planning on revisiting this idea in an article I plan working on uh, within the next year. There will be some duplication with the introduction at the beginning of the class, including an introduction to each of the student presenters. The slides for these sessions are available on the website for the course. Thanks to Dean Hari Asofsky, Dean Engel, and all of the administrative staff that contributed to this course. A special thanks to Tim McCarthy, who taped all of the sessions and did an amazing job in ensuring that the April 20 program, which had participants from all over the country, went off without a hitch on Zoom. So a special thanks to Tim. Again, I thank all of you for viewing our class. And I just want you to know 
that this isn't the last time I'm going to do this class. I'm scheduled to do it again in the fall, and I plan to make it available to anyone over the internet. So thank you, and I will see you in the fall. Okay, Nicole, you're up. Okay, let me just get my share screen going. Um... Oh, by the way, what did you guys, what did you ladies think of our, our program last week? It was really good. Yeah, I enjoyed the program as well. It was awesome. I wish that we had met earlier to talk about it because now I kind of forgot it. Or I mean, I forgot some parts of it, but I do remember like laughing very hard at like, I want to say it was the first Leo Strine. Yeah, like the first people to present because yeah. it was like, I guess I just had never heard, I don't know, the guy that the like opposing opinion that was interesting debate, I guess, but I just, the opposing opinion man, like his words were just so old, I guess. Like he was just such an old white man. It was hard to listen, I suppose. <laughs> it was just very funny, I guess, to see the dialogue in such a professional debate as opposed to just like something you would see on Twitter. Like, it, it, I don't know, it was funny. Yeah, I liked interesting. it. You, you, he is an old white man. He's 86 or 87 years old. And he taught me this course, the course we're in now, 50 years ago, this month. So 50 years ago this month, I was, I was getting ready to present in his course uh, the paper I'm going to talk about at the end of our session today. That's hilarious. What was the name of the, oh, sorry, Brittany. No, I, I was just going to say, I don't even know which one was your professor. So I want to clarify. I just, I'm, I'm remembering it was one person was arguing um, like that there should be, you know, some type of mandated situation as, and the other person was like, oh no, it should just be shareholders. If shareholders wanted yeah, minority, yeah. Yeah. they would let them. And that's the dude that I'm like, I've not even heard somebody, you know, be ignorant enough to say that position. I don't know. I guess I have. But the other guy was making me laugh because he was getting a little angry. It's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that's Leo Strine. He used to be the chief just chief justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. In your corporations course, you may not remember it, but you, I'm sure you read three, four, five, six opinions of his. He's he was he was one of the most uh, prolific uh, judges to ever serve on in the Delaware. Uh, in the Delaware courts, and he's as smart as a, he can possibly be, and he's got as much energy as anybody could possibly have. Okay, Nicole, you're up. Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? I can. Okay, um, so my paper topic for this semester, I did um, the concept of race neutral or race fair. Um, and then I did an analysis of racially neutral federal policies and their impact on the racial wealth gap. Um, so I, I, I brought up the topic of race neutral or race fair because so many people think that we need to, um, they, they talk about being colorblind, um, but later on in the presentation, you'll see how this isn't the correct way to go about it because there are past wrongs that need to be repaired. Um, so we need to opt for a more race fair legislation um, and a race fair outlook on our federal policy making. Uh, so my paper starts with um, an introduction to the racial wealth gap. Um, I talk about what wealth is and that is the culmination of um, uh, the possession of a family entity. So it includes their income, it includes all of their expenses, and it also includes um, other entities as well, such as the homes that they own um, and the gifts that they inherit from, um, from their family, your, the parents, their grandparents, um, and that creates generational wealth, which we'll talk about um, in the next slide because it's very important for um, the substance of my paper. Um, and then I also talk about what the racial wealth gap is. Um, I think we've spent a lot of time at the beginning of the semester hammering that home. Um, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that, but essentially it's, it's just the, the disparity between 
minority um, or are persons of color and um, the wealth that white people in America have. Um, and it's uh, the, the difference in, in wealth um, that we've talked about before. And then I talk about how the racial wealth gap has developed. So we start out with um, the, the first slaves that land in Jamestown in 1619, um, and then the 246 years of chattel slavery after that obviously has set back um, Black people in America be, uh, because their white counterparts were building wealth um, from that point on. And, and we have families in America, um, particularly white families in America who are you know, members of the Daughters of the American Revolution or things like that. So they've been here for a long time and they've been benefiting from um, this generational wealth, um, whereas um, Black people and other people of color in America have been, essentially, they've, they've been left out or excluded from um, these benefits. Um, so the concept of generational wealth was something that was really important to my paper. So this refers to any kind of asset that families pass down to their children or their grandchildren, or even their great-grandchildren. The inheritance can be in the form of cash, investment funds, stocks and bonds, properties, or even businesses. We have a lot of family-run businesses. Um, I live in a small town, so we have, you know, the air conditioning is, is called Gary and Sons, and our, our, our mechanic is, you know, Lang and Sons. So it's, we have a lot of family businesses, and even though you might not think of those necessarily as, um, you know, wealth building, that it really is. Um, and white families statistically receive much larger inheritances on average than black families. And I found um, in my research that inheritance, inheritances and other intergenerational transfers account for more of the racial wealth gap than any other demographic and socioeconomic indicators. Um, so this is, this is a huge part of my paper. Um, some of the solutions that I have listed later on in the presentation um, work towards narrowing this gap. Um, Sam brought something up when he um, gave me my comments on my outline, and he had mentioned um, the uh, changing the inheritance taxes and the, the gift tax. Um, that is something that people have talked about and people have brought up. For the sake of my paper, I haven't focused on it um, because so many of the other articles that I found have really hammered that point home, and I, and I wanted to sort of give us you know, other avenues and other options, because I think it, it needs to be more than just, you know, one option or, or one fix, essentially. Um, so this presentation won't focus um, so much on taxes, but more on, on the other avenues that we can take. And then the racial wealth gap, as I said, we have, um, can be traced back to this nation's inception. Um, and then there are also, I found, um, you know, mention of the congressional mismanagement of the Freedmen Savings Bank, which was a bank that um, freed slaves uh, were able to put the money that they made if they had worked um, with the Union Army during the Civil War. And they put their money into this bank, they deposited it, I believe it was some 61,000 freed Black um, families deposited into this bank, um, but it was severely mismanaged. Um, they tried to expand too quickly, and the bank ended up closing with no protections for the depositors. So these people who, the deposits were small amounts, anywhere from five to $50, but that five to $50 could have changed these people's lives if it was handled correctly in the bank. Um, and Overall, the Freedman Savings Bank ended up losing $3 million for the 61,000 some odd depositors in it. Um, so right there, we see another large step back um, for Black people in America. And then we also have, obviously, the years of violence against Black and other minority communities. Um, we still see it today. Um, but two particular examples that I had seen in my research that came up time and time again were the um, Memphis riot, and I believe it was 1866, and then the, the Tulsa race massacre um, of the Greenwood, um, they called it the Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Um, and those, they, they decimated the wealth that these black communities had been building. They burned homes and churches, schools, um, they, they killed quite a few people. Um, the Tulsa race massacre is one of the worst instances of race, race field violence in this country. And they, for so long, tried to sweep it under the rug 
um, but it's, it's finally coming out and, and getting the attention that it deserves. Um, and then we also have the discriminatory policies such as the Jim Crow era, um, which I'm sure we're all at least hopefully somewhat familiar with from our school education. Um, so although the Jim Crow era itself um, and, the, and the black codes that came out of it, um, they affected everyday life, every aspect of life for um, black people living in the, in the South. Um, one particular thing that I focus on in my paper is the effect that it had on education um, because one of the solutions I have for helping to narrow the gap is promoting um, a more equal access to education. Um, but because of the Jim Crow era and the black codes and the segregation in the South, um, which is where a majority of the black population was at the time, um, just because of the, the, they had been populated there from slavery and had not had the means to leave. Um, they, they segregated these schools and um, so often black schools did not receive the funding that they needed. And um, a lot of times children had to leave school um, to go and work and give money for their families because they didn't have that, that generational wealth that their white counterparts did. And education, unfortunately, wasn't, um, wasn't a priority when you needed to get food on the table. And again, that gave them a step back and their white counterparts were building wealth where um, black Americans were just trying to keep their head above water. Um, so then I, I, I get in specifically into a, a second section of my paper on the facially neutral federal policies. And I focus particularly a large chunk of that on the GI Bill and the programs and policies developed under Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, but then I, I do touch on the modern issues because it, it is these facially neutral federal policies did not stop when the New Deal, you know, ended when they stopped putting out programs under it in um, 1939. There are modern issues still, and I included those in my paper as well. Um, so the GI Bill is credited with helping low income veterans with the opportunity for economic mobility, um, but and for building this, this, this white middle class. But unfortunately, black veterans were denied many of the benefits that the GI Bill provided um, because the administration was left at the Southern level, um, at the Southern local level. And I, I included a point here that although it was colorblind legislation, the way the program was, was administered shows a true picture of how colorblind legislation can be discriminatory um, because these, these black veterans weren't able to make use of the housing provisions of the GI Bill um, because banks wouldn't make loans for mortgages in black neighborhoods or they wouldn't even give them the money to to further their education. Um, so again, we see a widening between black Americans and white Americans, um, which created the, the chasm of the, the wealth gap. And then the New Deal, there are so many programs that were created under the New Deal and, and people held it out to be this social revolution that raised the entire nation to a plateau of social well-being. But people, people who are advocates or proponents of the New Deal, they tend to ignore the fact that only half the jobs in the economy at the time were that it was enacted were covered. Um, so this left out farm and domestic workers, which were positions filled primarily of color. And statistically, 65% of African Americans fell outside the reach of the program. And in the South, that number went as high as 80%. And the exclusion lasted until 1950. And by that time, a majority of Black Americans were even further economically behind their white counterparts. Um, we saw the same thing with the labor regulations and standards. Um, the coverage again left out a portion of minority communities, a large portion of minority communities because it excluded domestic workers and agricultural laborers. So it left discriminatory practices at a local level and minority workers tended to be assigned to the least skilled jobs if they were assigned to jobs at all. And then we have a huge section on a discrimination in housing, which um, still, still exists to this point today, um, although that we have the Fair Housing Act, which um, was supposed to repair and, and equalize housing, um, it, we have this thing called the Urban Development Act of 1968, um, which includes this thing called this section called um, Section 235 that let lower income people get subsidized mortgages. Um, and it, it was not the saving grace that low income minority communities needed 
because it was filled with fraud and abuse from real estate personnel and neighborhoods that tended to prey on these minority communities. Um, and then we ended up with blocks of vacant and foreclosed homes owned by the FHA, which further drove down property value and in turn further drove down the wealth that people who were able to remain owners of their home were, ha um, were able to hold in their families. Um, so modern issues and discrimination in lending, it, it still exists. Um, we see it in redlining, in housing projects, um, in contract buying, in block busting, and in predatory lending. Um, so all of these, um, we, I don't think we have enough time to go over each one of them in depth, but they're all still modern discrimination um, and have been seen as recently as this past year. Um, Nicole, and, and me, they, can I just ask yes. you a question? Can you just take a minute on the contract buying? Issue. Yes. No, it was a yes. huge issue back in the 60s. Is it, is it still an issue? Right. Yes. Um, so Sam actually commented that on my outline, um, if contract buying was still a thing today. So contract buying is when a private entity or private owner um, has this home, they own the home, and they do sort of a Essentially, it's a rent to own type situation, but the payments on it are incredibly high. Um, so they would prey on minority communities who dreamed of owning their own home, and they would charge them these insanely high rates with insanely high interest, and they would they didn't own the home while they were making these payments. So if they missed one payment, they lost out on, on their home and they lost out on the exorbitant amount of money that they had been paying. Um, and I did find an article that mentioned contract buying um, was occurring as recently as 2016 um, in uh, Akron, Ohio. Um, people were selling these quote unquote fixer uppers um, and it was still uh, affecting the minority community and they were, they were charging them an exorbitant amount of money to, I guess, sort of rent these homes in a rent to own situation. Um, so it is as recently as, as 2016 at least, um, but I, I, it was predominantly in the Midwest and the South again. And then I came up, I didn't come up with them. I, in my research, I found three possible solutions um, that would assist in narrowing the gap. So we have increasing intergenerational wealth through home ownership, encouraging equal opportunity to education and promoting alternative education opportunities for aspiring minority entrepreneurs who maybe necessarily don't have the time or the ability to go to um, you know, a traditional four-year program or a traditional MBA program or things like that. Um, so increasing the intergenerational wealth through home ownership was one of the most important points for me um, in this paper because home ownership is the greatest source of wealth in the United States and minorities have been systematically excluded from opportunities to secure homeowner status as discussed previously. Um, so I think we're able to expand access to home ownership would be one of the best strategies to change the status quo and to make strides in narrowing the racial wealth gap. Um, so we would be able to replace the mortgage interest and real estate tax deduction, which is not necessarily something that I um, have a deep understanding with, um, but we would be able to use the savings from that, which would be vast, to create a public home purchase fund, which would support first time home buyers. Um, and it would take into account the wealth that those people have at the time. Um, so when considering this, you would uh, fill out the application for a first time home buyer only, um, and they would receive some sort of stipend or encouragement to purchase their, their first home. Um, and then Congress must also reform foreclosure law and increase public policy around lending. Um, as we've seen, lending and foreclosure is harming minority communities um, at a much higher rate than it, is at, um, than it is their white counterparts. And then my biggest point was to develop baby bonds. Um, so I've discussed this earlier in one of my presentations, um, but I did a little bit of further research and these would give money to build two children upon their birth, um, determined on the wealth of a family, not the income. And it would allow the child to have access to this account, which has continued gaining interest um, at 18, but they would only be able to get it for asset enhancing events. So education, starting a business, something like that, buying a home. Um, and this could also be beneficial for, um, you know, gaining access to education. Um, but some statistics say that if we encourage baby bonds and use baby bonds, this could limit 70 to 80% of the wealth gap over time. Um, and then an equal opportunity to education is incredibly important. Um, 
and it's the most universally accepted pathway for economic mobility. So not only would we be able to use the baby bonds for that, but we also need to change um, the tax structure so that each school district gets an equal amount um, rather than the more wealthy school districts getting more funding based on their income or their property taxes. And finally, we need to do alternative education opportunities for aspiring minority entrepreneurs. So we should be encouraging access to social capital and we should be increasing entrepreneurship education and increasing access to innovation, such as our law school clinics. Um, we need to increase those um, access to those and increase the, the number of those across the country. Um, a key strategy would be make uh, incubators and accelerators also more inclusive. Um, but I note that a better approach would be to eat, address all of these needs simultaneously. So we could duplicate or expand the Ascend 2020 initiative, um, which is something that I had talked about in a previous presentation um, in class. We read um, quite a lengthy piece on it, but it was developed by the University of Washington and it addresses all three of the needs for management education, access to capital, and, um, and networking as well. Um, so if we're able to address things simultaneously and take active, proactive steps towards limiting, uh, narrowing the wealth gap rather than just creating more of these facially neutral policies and focusing more on um, race fair policies, we should be able to make at least some progress towards narrowing the wealth gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Any questions for Nicole? Um, so Sydney is saying, great job. I agree with her. It's a spectacular job. Um, no questions for Nicole. Okay. No questions. Bria, you're up. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing why white-owned businesses are more successful. Oh wait, I didn't start my picture. I guess it'd be helpful for you guys to see me. And it's fun trying to work this from presentation mode. There we go. All right, today we will, we will be discussing why white-owned businesses are more successful, steps to enhance Black-owned businesses, and the impact on the economy. So a quick overview, um, I initially based my article on racial inequality in business ownership and income by Robert Fairley um, because I had a strong interest in the earlier topics of this course. After reading the article by Robert Fairley, I decided to expand on my topic of racial inequality and business ownership with the focus on Black business ownership since Blacks are the most underrepresented minority in business ownership and uh, then take a look at the historic reasoning behind that and propose solutions. So just a quick overview of our discussion for today. I'm gonna to start off with why business ownership is important, factors that contribute to business ownership and income, what group is most underrepresented in business ownership, historic events that impact underrepresentation for that group, solutions moving forward, and how increasing minority business ownership will better the economy. So why business ownership is important? It's simple, wealth. Business ownership has historically been a strong wealth builder for communities of color. Business ownership reduces wealth inequality. The median net worth of business owners is two and a half times greater than that of non-business owners. And according to the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute for Black and Latinx business owners, the median net worth is more than 10 times that of their peers who do not own a business. Factors that contribute to business ownership, um, wealth, as the saying goes, it takes money to make money. Um, this is one of those things where it's tempting to ask, well, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, or in this case, the wealth or the business? Um, businesses help create wealth, but wealth is a factor contributing to first successfully owning a business. Um, Robert Fairley found that 
Wealth is the most important factor contributing to racial and ethnic patterns in business ownership. If you have less wealth, it's much harder to start a business, not only because it's hard to finance um, your own business, but because people, um, because you don't have collateral to get other business financing in addition to discriminatory lending practices. A majority of business owners rely on their own wealth or on the wealth of their family and friends to start and run a business. And as we know, um, there are large differences in wealth by race. At the median, Asian Americans have about 80% of the wealth of whites and Hispanics and African Americans have less than 10%. Oops, sorry, I forgot I had, I had all three factors on this one page. Okay, so moving on to age, uh, Blacks, Latinos, and Asians have younger population distributions than whites. A pattern of a younger average age poses a disadvantage because business ownership has been found to be positively associated with age. Older workers have more work and business experience, which is valuable in business ownership and outcomes. Lastly, the family dynamic. Family characteristics also contribute to the gap in business ownership rates between whites and blacks. Low marriage rates and low marriage rates and a positive association between marriage and business ownership par partially contribute to why blacks have lower business ownership rates. So factors that can contribute to business ownership. Um, education. Robert Fairley found that Education is the most important factor explaining racial and ethnic patterns in business income. Low levels of education among Blacks and Latinos explain a part of why they have lower business income. Working um, in the opposite direction, higher levels of education among Asian business owners place upward pressure on their business income relative to whites. And again, the family dynamic um, shows up. The next largest contribution is from family characteristics. Relatively low marriage rates among Black business owners explain a part of the gap in business income. You know, one of the things, um, uh, I forget just which paper mentioned this, but one of, one of the papers mentioned that, um, that in many cases, Black families will encourage their kids not to become not to go into business, but to become a teacher or something like that. And I and that's what happened in my case. My mother, um, my mother, you know, wanted me to go and become, um, you know, get a degree as a teacher, because as she as she said, you always have a job. And when I talked about possibly going out and establishing a business. Um, she really poo-pooed that idea. Um, so, you know, I've, I've directly experienced, uh, experienced that in my, uh, in my own personal family with my mother. Yeah, I think a lot of times black families are risk adverse when it comes to job stability. And so they'll encourage you to go into certain fields or go work for established corporations rather than stepping out on your own and, and facing that risk. Because in a lot of cases, um, explained by wealth in general, you don't have something to fall back on, if you will, um, if it doesn't work out for you. So Blacks are the most underrepresented group in business ownership. Um, there's essentially no business ownership gap between whites and Asians. 3% of Blacks own a business, 5.8% of Latinos own a business, 6.6% of Asians own a business, and 7.3% of non-Latino whites own a business. The percentage of the workforce that owns a business is 4.5% among Blacks and 7.9% among Latinos. The business ownership to workforce rates are higher for Asians at 9% and non-Latino whites at 9.6%.
This chart shows um, business income by race and ethnicity. And it shows that there's essentially no business income gap between whites and Asians. Although there is a large gap in business income between non-white Latinos and Latinos, Latinos are still represented more in business ownership. So now we're gonna shift to historic events that had a major impact on not only black business, but the black experience in America. I think a lot of the time when we talk about discrimination and disenfranchisement in the business sense, we stick to the current issues of discriminatory lending practices, et cetera, which are of extreme importance, but I think that it is also important to examine the history that led to the lack of business ownership in the Black community. And so I have a lot of the same things that Nicole said, so I do not want to just repeat, but... Yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's quite a bit of repeti uh, repetition in many of the papers, and to the extent you can um, uh, not focus on things that are have already been discussed. That would be that would be helpful. Okay, so it takes a big chunk out of uh, my presentation, but we're just gonna go ahead and move right on to solutions. So um, a lot of the articles that I read mentioned government programs and funding, which are important, but in addition to business grants and policies that promote minority business development, I think that it is important to have criminal reform that contributes to ending mass incarceration and in turn enhances education, wealth, and the family dynamic. I also believe that offering quality mentorship can aid in minority business development. One article I read entitled Business sorry, excuse me, building supportive ecosystems for black owned US businesses stated that research on New York based startups shows that founders who are mentored by top performing entrepreneurs are three times more likely than their co located peers without mentors to become top performers themselves. Outside the startup world, a knowledgeable contact may help a prospective entrepreneur make decisions such as whether to buy a franchise, um, for upfront capital or to build an independent business. So how increasing minority business ownership will better the economy? Business formation is associated with the creation of new industries, innovation, job creation, improvement in sector productivity and economic growth. Entrepreneurship and business ownership particularly of community-based businesses are crucial ways to develop community wealth for both business owners and the people they employ. Healthy Black-owned businesses could be a critical component for closing the United States Black-white wealth gap, which is projected to cost the economy $1 trillion to $1.5 trillion in 2018 dollars per year by 2028. And that is all that I have. Great. So any questions for Bria? Okay, Bria, no questions for you. Great job. Uh, so thank you. Alexis, you're up. Okay, sorry. Um, let me go back a slide. Ah. Okay, so I'm talking about the unequal access to capital, financing issues, minority business owners face. So essentially, the, like it says, the financing issues, um, since minority business owners tend to have less capital than white business owners. It's a lot of the previous presentations I've talked about. So I start off the paper by going over an overview of what is capital. And the four main areas of capital that I talk about are debt financing, equity financing, venture capitalist, and angel investors. And so with debt, finance, debt financing, as we've gone over in class, it's getting loans from banks and things like that. I talk about the pros and cons of each of these sources of capital. So for example, um, debt financing, what you retain is ownership 
unlike with equity financing, you're giving up ownership for them to give you money. But with equity financing, um, you don't run the risk of default like you do with debt financing because debt financing, you have to pay things back um, on a monthly schedule and equity financing is more flexible. And then I talk about venture capitalists, which are people who are investing in, these are normally bigger companies as compared to angel investors, which are private individuals who are using their personal wealth to fund your business. Um, and for example, venture capitalists go, they are willing to invest more, which is why they invest a little bit later in the game. They don't help at the very early stages of a business because it's hard to tell at that point which business is going to be successful and which one isn't. And so they like to play the market a little bit. Angel investors invest less, but they invest early on. They are the, the very beginning people to help with finance. And then I talk about disparity and access to capital. So what the current disparity is and what causes it. A big cause is the wealth gap of, as our last two presenters kind of went over. Um, the wealth gap is just a major cause because you can't have personal wealth to start a business if you've never, if you nor your family have ever had the personal wealth. And that's a lot of what startups are. It's you investing in yourself. And if you don't have that source of capital and you don't have that personal wealth to invest, you don't have as many opportunities as your white counterparts would. And then the other issue when it comes to disparity is debt financing. It's the way our system is set up for loans. They look at um, credit score and home ownership. And again, going back to the wealth gap, if you don't have that wealth, you're not gonna get the loan. And if you can't get the loan, you're not gonna have the money to start your business. And therefore we don't have as many minority business owners. Um, and there's a, there's a statistic. Um, it's like 90% of Latino owners have um, Ninety percent of Latino small businesses struggle to access capital and support they need to launch and grow. And that's just one. And so what we see is a lot of minorities make up a big part of the population. Um, African Americans make about 13 percent of the population. Hispanics make up about 18 percent and Asians make up about six percent. Yet all minority businesses make up less than two percent of total businesses in the country. So there's clearly a disparity and that's what my paper wants to focus on. And then I also talk about the economic impact this disparity has by the lack of jobs and money that goes into the economy if we were to have better minority business systems in place. And then instead of leaving it on a very bleak and sad note, I like to end with some possible solutions. So the first solution I talk about is funding the MBDA which is the Minority Business Development Agency. Um, currently, Congress does not fund them that much. They don't have a lot, but their whole goal is to help minority businesses get up off their feet and start and launch. And so it would not take creating a whole new law. All Congress would have to do is redirect some of the funds um, in their annual budget towards the MBDA. And therefore we will have more programs that can help minority businesses um, launch. And then the second solution is restructuring the lending system. So in talking about disparity, we said, I said the debt system is one of the major issues. Well, if we could restructure how we give loans and how banks determine who is worthy of a loan and worthy is a poor word, you know what I'm saying, um, who should, get a loan essentially. Um, if we can restructure that and instead of looking at home ownership and things like credit score, which tend to be worse for minorities because of the wealth gap, if we start looking at things that will predict how good they will be with their debt financing, like paying their utilities on time and managing rent, things like that will predict how they will be with the loan and their repayment system. And that if we, 
rearrange the FICO um, system, we can have more loans going into minority businesses. And then very broadly, supporting impoverished communities. During this pandemic, a lot of people were pushing the movement of support local. Well, that's something we needed to be doing a long time ago, not just because of the pandemic. Um, a lot of these communities are very poor and the poor communities will not have the funds or the resources to start a business because that's the area with not as many banks and a lot of investors will predict whether your business is going to be a success based on the neighborhood you're trying to start it in and if it's a poor neighborhood they're not going to want to invest so if we start building up the economy in these poor neighborhoods where a lot of minorities are we will see more businesses flourishing and then that is my paper okay thank you so much any questions for Alexis? I have a question, Alexis. Could you go back to the slide with minority development corporations, please? Yes. Which one? Yeah. yeah. One? Minority business development. Uh, what's that? Minority business development association? Oh, the MBDA. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That so one. can you can you tell us again exactly what the MD, MBDA is? So the MBDA is the Minority Business Development Association. Um, and it is a government program that was funded, I want to say in the 60s is what I have here. So it, it doesn't currently exist, is that right? No, it does. It does, okay. Yes. But it's not very active? No, it just doesn't have a lot of funding. Okay, now how does this relate to MESBIX? And are MESBIX still in existence? Do you know, uh, Brittany, do you recall in your studies about the SBA, a, about MESBIX? Right. I remember that's what you mentioned last class, correct, Professor? I, I I mentioned it because I don't have it clearly in my in my own mind. Right. I'm pretty sure that was like an initial program, but that it has since been like taken over by a new program. So that was like the initial uh, attempt at helping minorities, but then it's been changed since. Do you know? If, has it been replaced? Um. Give me a minute and I can let you know. The MBDA, it, who runs that, Alexis? Is that the Commerce Department? Uh, yeah, it should be. Um, and they get their funding from the discretionary spending um, that Congress is responsible for. Okay. Okay, any questions for Alexis? Okay, very interesting, Alexis. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to Brittany. Sure thing. All right, let me share my screen with you. Okie dokie. Percent. Okay. I believe it should be sharing with y'all. Um, so my, my presentation or my project, I suppose, is a little different um, than a lot of y'all's just because it's a little more targeted. Um, so mine is more or less a proposal for a minority business accelerator um, funded by Penn State. So some background here. Um, Professor Tom Sharbaugh, he works obviously at Penn State. Um, he teaches as well as runs a clinic of the Entrepreneur Assistance Clinic. My first year I took the business or the business law concepts or something, um, which Professor Sharbaugh taught with Professor Riley. That's how I met him. And then through that got a job with him over the summer. And then since then I've just worked at the Entrepreneur Assistance Clinic 
for the max amount of credits that you can. And I've worked there for two summers. So Professor Sharbaugh and I have a pretty close relationship. He asked me earlier in this semester if I would be interested in helping with the feasibility study. Um, and so as an overview, as of now, um, we've already in the background of this uh, spoken with Penn State, Invent Penn State, and also Penn State Law, and the Penn State and Lehigh Valley, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Um, so to just give a general overview, like I said, of what we've done thus far, um, Tom approached me asking if I'd like to help him um, with the logistics of this feasibility study. Like I said, I'd never done a feasibility study before. I was honest about that. Um, and he helped me out on the logistics of what we're doing. So baseline, we, Tom, I suppose, heard about the minority business accelerator or the concept of a minority business accelerator, which I will talk about. Um, but basically it, it is a program that targets um, startup businesses that are owned by minorities and helps with access to funding and also um, training and mentorship. So we'll get more into it, like I said, but Tom had heard of this Cincinnati NBA that was very successful. Um, and there's a few of them across the country. And he thought, you know, with Penn State's clout and the resources we have, it seems this would be a great project for Penn State to, ins to install in uh, Pennsylvania City. Um, so we've looked through the cities of Pennsylvania. University Park would obviously be a great uh, area to suggest launching this just because of ease, like we're already here. But to point out the obvious, University Park is not a very diverse area. So we looked through Pennsylvania and tried to find an area that seemed more fitting. Um, so near the end of the presentation, I'll give you more, a little more statistics about Lehigh Valley specifically. Uh, it's an area of Pennsylvania that encompasses three cities um, and has a larger minority rate than in the rest of Pennsylvania, specifically University Park. Um, it's also closely located to New York City and Philadelphia, so it's a large commuting area. Um, and it has, it's one of the only areas in Pennsylvania that has had an a consistently increasing population as well as a growing economy. So the like environmental aspects and characteristics of the area would be well fit for a business accelerator in the area. So working with Tom, we have connected with Annette Dernack, who is the director of the business development at the um, Lehigh Valley Launch Box. So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, the launch box, there's, I'm drawing a blank right now, but like 20 plus of them across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, almost all of them look, er, are affiliated with Penn, Penn State. Um, so there's one downtown, for those of you who don't know, it's over by the Panera. It's the big building that has a weird box on it. Um, and so the launch box is a working space. Anyone is welcome to come into. Um, it's open to the community now that COVID hit, it's probably a little different, but that's also where the IP clinic and the entrepreneur clinic is like hosted from. Um, so any community member can come in there and there's a lot of programs set from those buildings. So in this Lehigh Valley launch box specifically, um, they already have a lot of, they're basically uh, an in-between of a business accelerator and a business incubator. Um, oh, well, I'll skip that. Um, I'll come back to that, sorry. But I'll come back to in a little bit, a little bit more about the Lehigh Valley Launchbox or, or yeah, the Lehigh Valley Launchbox. But basically just know that a Launchbox, it, there's multiple of them across the state and they're um, open working spaces and they're set up specifically to help startup and entrepreneurs uh, and startup companies. And so one cool thing is that like the legal clinics of Penn State offer our services across the state of Pennsylvania. So we help entrepreneurs and startups for free. Um, and they also have mentor programs within the launch box that are already existing, which is why we, Tom and I have suggested just uh, using this location as the initial pilot location 
for a minority business to, um, accelerator in Pennsylvania. Okay. So hey, background uh, overview uh, of the Brittany, issue. Brittany, can, yeah, can, I, can I just ask you for a clarification? Absolutely. Uh, until I read your paper and I I'd heard Tom talk about it, um, but I can't articulate clearly what a minority business accelerator is and then the other one is a launch box right yeah the other one is an incubator incubator so, can you can you just yeah. give us a a good explanation of what we're talking about absolutely so that works well because i pretty much i'm going to just i'll come back to that so we'll just skip that because the background issues have been discussed a lot today so we'll skip on ahead to the differences between a business accelerator and an incubator so um obviously it, it'll come down to terminology but you can either say business accelerator or startup accelerator um here we'll just stick with business but you know it's the same thing so both concepts are targeting startup and early stage companies and helping them grow so the difference here would be a business incubator focuses on innovation so it more or less incubates the idea that a company may have so a startup company before or in their very early stages would be coming to an incubator and more or less um just kind of throwing out this idea like to a professional and like a mentor in this program saying this is my business idea i'm planning to do x y or z what do you think and the mentor kind of comes back more or less as like a teacher role, looking through what you're suggesting to do, editing it, revising it, and helping you actually come up with a game plan, more of a behind the scenes, like before your big launch, what you should be doing. Um, so because it's beforehand, um, it's more of an open-ended discussion. Um, there's not typically any time constraints as opposed to the business accelerator. Uh, which is focusing on scaling the business. So for a business incub or a startup incubator, it's a lot less selective. Um, it's just, if you have an idea, you should bring it to us and we'll help you kind of decide whether or not it's legitimate and whether it's worth following in a sense. Brittany, then, I have heard, Brittany, I've heard this term scaling and I, I, I see you using it as well. What in the hell does scaling mean? Great question. Um, basically, it just means growing. Um, so for a business accelerator, um, and well, I also say these terms are a little more general. So I'll give the caveat that my explanations are going to be directly applied to the business accelerator that we are proposing. Um, but the point of it would be to scale, meaning um, as a the business accelerator program, say in Lehigh Valley, or yeah, we'll say that because that's what we're launching. Um, so you're a started business, you're already established, you've been working maybe a year or two. Um, so you have some understanding of what you're doing. You'll come to this business accelerator where we'll offer a multitude of services. Namely, we help you get access to capital and we will connect you with anchor companies. So you'll get more into it once we learn more about the specific Cincinnati Business Accelerator. I think that would probably help you. Good. Or, I mean, I think, All right. Go ahead, good. All right, cool. Um, exemplify what it is, but basically scaling is gonna be, you started here and we're gonna scale you bigger and like branch you out. We'll start regionally. You're already starting in your little city. We'll help you branch out regionally, maybe by state and then nationwide, depending on how big you're going to eventually launch. Um, so we're basing, does it, before I go on, does anyone have any questions about incubators versus accelerators? All right, cool. So then we're basing, um, there's a few MBAs out there, or I'll, I'll specifically actually, let me backtrack, sorry, I got a little off. With the incubators and accelerators, just for uh, overview and understanding, they're not specifically in any way targeting minorities. They are just overall startup incubators and startup accelerators are helping any startup company. So for instance, the uh, State College Launchbox in the downtown area, I know a little more about just because I worked there for a few years, 
with the entrepreneurs clinic, um, there is a multitude of, of programs offered. So if you're, we had, you know, students come in that said like, yo, me and a few of my friends had this idea and we were wondering if you could help us put it into action. So it's mentors who have, you know, they're corporate owners, they're CEOs, they're executives who have gone through this before, know the works, and they're able to show you, you know, like, hey, here's going to be step one, two, and three of how you actually get your business off the ground. So now, now, hold, hold on, Brittany, just a minute. Go ahead. Can you just take a minute? We've got three terms here. We've got accelerator, we've got a launch box, and we got an innovator, right? Incubator. Incubator. Okay, what's the how how does the launch box relate to the incubators and the accelerators? Sure. So the launch box is more or less just like a an open a co-working space. So the launch box in Penn State, we'll say the one downtown location, it's just an open co-working space that really anyone can come into um, and sit down, there's a few rooms. It's like a public library to an extent. You can come in with your laptop, whatever you want, and just work in there. At For convenience, uh, there's in the Penn State office, there's Jason, who's like the front desk man. Um, if you're new to this launch box, you'd walk up to Jason and you'd you know, kind of introduce yourself, say, I'm whoever, and this is what my plan is. You And by that, you'd either be saying, I have a company and I'm doing work, or I'm thinking of starting a company and the launch box is staffed with people to help you, basically to help place you in what program would be appropriate for your business. So there's going to be at the launch box, there will be both incubators and accelerators. The launch box, just think of it as the overall location that these people can come to. Hmm. So the importance here is that Tom and I are off or are pitching the Lehigh Valley launch box because we've already connected with, first of all, Lehigh Valley is, we argue the best area in Pennsylvania to pitch the idea. Um, and we've already been in contact with the owner, the director of the launch box and she's already on board. And so that would obviously cut costs of implementing. Okay, now, and so now are you, are you guys proposing that the Lehigh Valley do an incubator and an accelerator? Is that what you're proposing? No, so the Lehigh, we're, we're, we're proposing that the Lehigh Valley launch box that we open or, or launch, which is lack of a better term, a minority business accelerator in the Lehigh Valley launch got box. You, Think got of you. the launch box as a building. Yeah. Okay. Would okay. it be, would it be a mi minority based incubator and accelerator or just accelerator? Just accelerator. Why is that? So, um, I'll get that. I'll get in that. I think it would be best to okay. describe the sense. Okay. So as I said earlier, the difference between incubators and, and accelerators, incubators are kind of coming with an idea that's not necessarily hashed out and we're going to help you get it onto paper and, you know, maybe file for a company legally and do the behind the scenes work. Once you get to the point of a, an accelerator, you've already somewhat established yourself. You are a open working business and now we're helping you get from stage one to stage two. So um, for obvious reasons, the success rate for accelerator participants is a lot higher than the success rate for incubator participants. Um, and so the reason we're focusing on, or we're suggesting, propose, like we're proposing this accelerator as opposed to an incubator um, is because we're trying to target the overlying issue, which, oh, let me skip, sorry overlying issue, which I kind of skipped for this presentation because it's been covered so much um, by the previous presenters, um, but basically just the wealth gap um, and how over time that has led to the lack of access to capital for minority business owners. So um, more or less the reason we're targeting or proposing an accelerator is because while incubators help you launch a business and kind of get off, you know, get your feet set and, and see where you're supposed to be headed. An accelerator is going to take a business and actually help it once it's formed, um, connect with anchor companies and get access to capital 
which we are seeing as the disconnect between uh, a minority business launching and being successful versus having to close down because they aren't getting the right resources. Does that answer your question? Yep. All right, cool. So now we'll just take a kind of brief overview um, or a quick overview of the Cincinnati Minority Business Accelerator. Um, so their mission specifically is to expand the minority entrepreneurial community uh, by helping accelerate the growth and development of sizable African-American and Hispanic owned businesses. Um, so since its founding in 2003, the CMBA has had an incredible impact on this region, um, supporting over or 67 portfolio companies, uh, driving $1.2 billion in regional minority spending, and it's created over 3,500 jobs. So to get into the nitty gritty of their particular, um, like the, the Cincinnati's MBA and what we're kind of basing our model off of. So the Cincinnati, the CMBA has a two-fold approach. Um, they're looking at the two-sided market, or I mean a two-sided market approach. So they're helping portfolio companies, which they define as minority owned business enterprises with annual revenues of $1 million or more. Um, and they're connecting them with goal setters who, or what they call goal setters, which are anchors or like large local purchasing institutions um, that have already committed to evaluating new projects for the CMBA. So basically, the Cincinnati Minority Business Accelerator connects local businesses um, or local startups in their early stages, local minority owned startups, with anchor companies in the area. So there's going to be already pre established mid to large range companies in this regional area that are partnering with the CMBA. Um, and then I, as this mid to large company partnering with the CMBA have already you know, expressed, I'm willing to look through this portfolio company's information uh, and opportunities and help going forward. And so I will then like, I'll be working with this portfolio company coming in. So it's, we're helping each other. I'm giving you mentor advice. I'm helping you with the accelerators, helping you with business assessments, analysis. And then between the portfolio company and the goal setters is that these goal setters, which are large, mid, whatever, pre-established companies are gonna have contracts that they need fulfilled. And then the accelerator will pair them with a up and coming portfolio company that can fulfill whatever need that goal setter has. So that way, this accelerating program is going to obviously well, the number one issue is we're targeting this lack of access to capital and so we're one as the accelerator it's an it's going to be well based off the cincinnati profit it's a non-profit or model it's a non-profit company um so it can apply to grants also gets a lot of donations that money can help with these portfolio companies accessing to capital um, additionally, it's helping by providing mentor services um, and there's very particular timelines and, and check in like progress reports, basically, that someone assigned to you at the accelerator will be working with this portfolio company, making sure that they're doing the right steps, because obviously a lack of capital and a, a lack of human capital, really. So a lack of knowledge is what's keeping and preventing these companies from succeeding. So this accelerator not only provides these portfolio companies with the you know, monetary capital that they need to scale, but it's also supplying them with the human capital and the knowledge necessary to actually succeed and expand their companies. Um, additionally, it's helping the goal setters because they had a contract that needed fulfilling and now they're able to fulfill the contract. And also they specifically like the Cincinnati MBA specifically is going to be working with um, goal setters like and that have announced that they have certain diversity goals or um, whatever needs that they're trying to meet as well. So they're working together to bring both goals to an end. Um, and then quickly, sorry, I know I've been speaking a lot. 
I'll just say Lehigh Valley, um, more or less, I kind of already touched on a lot of this, but we chose Lehigh Valley um, as a proposed MBA for a few reasons. Um, uh, for knowledge, we're pitching that like the initial pitch should be in Lehigh Valley, like as a pilot. And then eventually we'd like to branch out in multiple locations. The reason we didn't choose Philadelphia to start with is because Philly already has a few business accelerator programs um, or similar programs in within the city. Um, so instead we decided it'd be better to choose a landscape that doesn't, you know, we're not kind of taking away resources. We're adding a new resource to an area that doesn't already have this. Um, as I said earlier, it's in a great location. It's more diverse than the most, than the surrounding Pennsylvania area. Um, and it is, it's in, including three different cities. So it'll be touching on a lot of um, a bigger people group than just one particular city. Um, and again, I kind of already said this at the beginning, but they have a growing population as well as a growing economy. And most importantly, the Lehigh Valley, the Lehigh Valley um, like entrepreneurship council has already like is above and beyond involved like they have a cool interactive map that already shows the big um investment companies that are residing in the area it has a list of black owned companies hispanic owned companies general minority owned companies um and also it has just like a map of the ecosystem um illustrating the like educational categories um government slash nonprofit categories and then like startup space as well as corporate spaces so overall lehigh valley already has a lot of the information we would need to collect so we think um it would be the most effective location to choose for installing this mba and that's it okay now let me ask you um uh, are are Penn State law students going to be involved in this? And if sure, so, so, how? Right. So, so, as I kind of said at the beginning, the clinic, the Penn State Entrepreneur Clinic, as well as the Intellectual Property Clinic, both operate out of the downtown launch box as of now, like in State College. That's where we operate out of. However, our services are available to anyone across the state. So, working there, um, they already, because we're, I don't actually know if it's because we're in a launch box or if it's just coincidentally, but we're already connected with all of the launch boxes across the state. So when a company comes into a launch box, uh, think more of in an incubator situation. I'm a new person. I have this idea. I'd love to start a company, but I don't even know what a corporation is. They'd go into an incubator and this incubator mentor would pair you up or would be paired with you, I suppose, help you step through step. And then also they would say, hey, here's the contact of the Penn State Law Clinic. You can contact them and they'll help with any legal aspects of what you're doing here. So as of now, um, I'll speak more to the EAC because I'm or Entrepreneur Clinic, I'm not sure. I know the IP Clinic, but I wasn't in it. So with Entrepreneur Clinic, um, our biggest thing is like choice of entity. We help companies choose whether LLC versus corporation or whatever. Um, and then we also help, we will file for you or with you, I guess, to start your corporation or whatever entity you choose. We do like the initial paperwork. So really any startup business work, the entrepreneur clinic already covers. And Tom with this proposal has also offered to expand the services of the entrepreneur clinic. Um, at this point, the only specific help I've get garnered um, was actually from my SBA presentation. I spoke with the two attorneys that helped me present and asked them like, you know, what you, they thought would be beneficial. And they mentioned just kind of like the licensing and regulations of applying for minority grants through the SBA. Um, so Tom has offered to expand the scope of our clinic to help minority businesses with that SBA um, grant application process. Um, and then like, we're still researching, trying to find more ways. Cause, cause like I said, or I don't know if I said, but like we think, or one thing that would set us apart from any other minority business accelerator across the country is that we're offering the clinic services as well. 
so we're trying to expand our services to you know encompass what these minority businesses would need um it's just that like again kind of a knowledge gap that we don't even know what necessarily they would need help with so does does the business school have a have a sim a clinic similar to our clinic the undergrad business school or the no the uh the mba school at the business school. oh um I'm not sure, actually. That's a great question. Because you guys might want to partner with them. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll text Tom about that. Okay. Um, Brittany, excellent job. Any questions or comments for Brittany? Okay, thank you, Brittany. We're on to Skylar. Skylar, you ready to roll? Yes, I am. If I can get... So, um, ironically, <laughs> um, like most of your presentations are uh, a little bit of what my paper um, is covering, um, but I think mine is more of a survey, so it won't be super repetitive and the things that are repetitive, I will not bore you all um, and <laughs> repeat it. So, um, I, I, my paper is actually focused on equity-based funding for minority-owned businesses. And the goal um, of this paper is one, I'm trying to create greater access to equity-based funding, um, especially given the existing structural barriers to obtaining debt that Alexis discussed already. Um, and so what this paper will do is provide sufficient detail um, and an overview on equity-based funding options for, more, for minority businesses um, in order for them to choose the best model, I mean, excuse me, the best funding option for their business model. And then further, um, I also wanted to detail some of the provisions that are important for them to protect themselves if they do go with equ equity-based funding because it is um, not free from its issues. So my paper's analysis is gonna focus on two things, um, but they are not exclusive at all. Um, so first, it's going to focus on inequity in Black-owned businesses. Um, as many of you have already mentioned, um, it's gonna start by highlighting some of the, some of the statistics that kind of show the disparities in the black business ownership and why that is the case. And then second, it's going to focus on equity based funding rather than debt financing, even though it will highlight debt financing just a little. Um, but I do this number one, I focus on black owned businesses because they are experiencing the largest gap. Um, but it's also not the paper can be um, accessible to other minorities as well. Um, and then I focus on equity once again because of the structural barriers. But then also when I was looking through the scholarship on equity-based funding, a lot of it is very just separate. Um, and so it will be nice to have scholarship um, and a, a well-published paper that actually overviews all or most of the funding options in one place rather than having to search for the particular type. Um, so that was the goal of my paper to kind of add to scholarship and also provide minority businesses a great starting point for these options. Um, so not going to repeat everything everyone said once again, but I do want to highlight just um, there are higher poverty, much higher poverty rates for black people, um, especially black founders that want to open businesses. Um, there are lower rates of wealth assets in the black community. Um, which are typically used for collateral for um, loans. Um, of course, the history of discrimination um, in mob and state violence um, that still continues, unfortunately. Um, and then also I wanna highlight, um, which not a lot of people talk about um, in general, but America experiences a very stagnant social mobility. So if you are, if you were born in poverty, it's very difficult for you to pull yourself up from your bootstraps. Um, and so the way that our society is set up, um, it is very difficult for people to leave poverty. And if they do leave poverty, um, it's very, it's even more difficult for them to try to pull their family out of poverty um, without them also losing their wealth, um, unfortunately, in return. So then- can I, I, can, I, can I just say something on that point? Of course. Uh, Skylar, mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew up in a small town, um, Steelton, Pennsylvania, which is uh, just uh, 90 miles from here. It's right on the other side of Harrisburg. It's a small town, a steel mill town. Uh, Bethlehem steel mill plant used to run the length of the town. Um, fortunately for me, my dad was a college graduate. My mom 
wasn't a college graduate, but she worked and was the, clearly the smartest person in the family. So, I mean, I come from a, a privileged background in, in many respects, um, particularly for Steelton, which was a, a middle class and lower middle class place. And of the kids who graduated with me uh, from High Steelton High, High School, um, three of, there were about 30 black kids in a class of 130, 140. And there were no Hispanic kids. There were no Asian kids. There were a couple of Jewish students, but it was mainly black and white students non-Jewish non, non white students. Um, of, of the 30 of us, the black students who graduated, two of us went directly to college, myself and another student named Pinard. Pinard was the, was the son of the minister at my church in Steelton and who had obviously gone to college. So the two black kids who went directly to college from uh, Steelton out of 30 were myself and Pinard, both of whom had fathers who had graduated from college. And there was one, to my, to my knowledge, there was only one other person who, from that group, who went on to college. And this was a kid named Herbie Hunter, who was raised by his aunt. And when he graduated from high school, he went on into the Marine Corps, spent four years in the Marine Corps. And then after he got out of the Marine Corps with the GI Bill, went to college, got his master's degree, got his PhD, and ended up as a professor at Penn State Harrisburg. Um, and so, I mean, he was the one, one other black student from Stilton High, from the Stilton High School class of 1961, who got, who was able to get a college education. Mm -hmm. Now, mo most people were able to get a job and, 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 and to work and, and provide uh, a good living for themselves. But when it came to college education, there were just three of us out of the 30. Sorry to interrupt, but your, your, uh, your, the point you were making sort of reminded me of, of uh, my own experience. No, I'm actually glad you brought that up because not to get too personal, but my mom, she also um, was raised in poverty. And the only way she was able to get out because she didn't have the money to go to college either, she had to spend four years in the Army Reserves. So, and she had to use a GI Bill. So I always pick on her because I'm like, dang, I could have went to school for free, but she had no choice, right? Um, which then provided me with choices. But I think that's really interesting because some people can't go straight out of college. I mean, excuse me, straight, straight out of high school because that's, they like, don't have the funds. Um, and they have to go through other means. And the military is prime for taking people that are in poverty and allowing them to go to college after they spend their four years. So, yeah. Right. And then, you know, I was in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam War, and uh, they put in the GI, they had a GI Bill. So my, uh, my, my, uh, my master's degree at Penn was paid for by, by the military. And I lived like a like a uh, like a prince in law school because I got my GI Bill and they gave me a scholarship as well. Yep. So, <laughs> so I was really uh, a privileged kid. Right. That I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation. That is fine. Yeah, my grandpa fought in the, the Vietnam War too, but you know it was too late by the time, so he couldn't use his GI Bill or whatever. Um, but yeah, so anyway, um, so then I'm sorry, the paper is going to move on to talk about access to capital. Um, and it's going to briefly highlight uh, the importance of debt financing because it is a the largest source of funding for startups. Um, however, once again, it's going to highlight that, um, you know, since credit scores and collateral are extremely important for securing loans, um, Blacks do have much lower rates. We also talked about earlier in the class the stigma behind their fear of getting denied for loans, um, even though they might have a higher chance than they think, but it's still very, very low. Um, and then also, I thought it was pretty interesting to note one more time that in the Kaufman survey article, it talked about credit worthiness is not as important to obtain debt financing in later stages of the startup process. So about year three, 
creditworthiness isn't as important. So really it's them obtaining that funding for the first three years that's the most difficult. But once they get past those three years, funding options kind of open up a little bit better for them. Um, so then I wanted to focus and move to focusing on equity funding for the rest of the paper. Um, there are currently very tiny rates of, of Black founders that actually use equity financing. Um, and this is a result of many factors, but I highlight the asymmetric um, asymmetric access to info, um, especially given that a lot of investors typically reach out to their networks. Well, if um, black, many black people are experiencing high poverty rates and only about 4% of black people are actually um, qualified to be an accredited investor. Um, and only, I think the numbers are less than 5% that are black that are also venture capitalists or angel investors. We have a very small network to hear this information from. And then on top of that, with the SEC, um, they have very strict rules on solicitation. So even if non-people of color wanted to go out and actually invest in these minority-owned businesses, um, unless there is a great project like um, Brittany and Tom are, are um, proposing, there is no way for these Black founders to go out and find investors that are willing to invest in minority businesses. So um, I think, and, and granted, um, Congress and the SEC are actually trying to work on this, which is why they created the Jobs Act um, and crowdfunding, because they're trying to get more investors, um, give access to investors um, and founders, so they can, you know, kind of bridge that gap so that we can increase our network um, and give them more of an opportunity to succeed. Um, and then also, which was very troubling, um, we talked about earlier in the semester that there is investor bias. So um, a lot of investors are afraid to invest in black owned businesses. Um, they feel that they don't know their market well enough. They don't feel like they'll have the resources. They just don't believe in their business models, um, especially given that you know there, there's a lot of, there's low capital to back it up. Um, there's a lot of different reasons, but even more discouraging is that um, there's actually been statistics to prove that black investors actually are more biased towards black founders um, and their belief in their dreams. So um, there's a lot of, of stigmas that they're fighting against with equity funding, but um, the goal of the paper is to kind of, if you give them more information um, and give them access to this information, then uh, we can kind of eliminate some of these stigmas. Excuse me, uh, Morgan, you just said something that I had never not heard before. Did you say that Black potential investors are less likely to invest in Black businesses than white potential investors? Is that what you said? Yep. Yeah, that was in one of the articles you assigned me in the beginning of this semester. And I remember talking about the crab in the bucket mentality when I presented it, because it was very discouraging. Okay. But that's then you're, I, I don't, I, I don't recall reading that in your, um, in your, uh, in your present paper, but is it, is it in there? Um, I don't believe it's in the outline, but I definitely plan to put that statistic in the paper. Would you, would you put it in, would you highlight in yellow and say, Sam, read or something like that, so I don't read over it, please? Yes, and I, I want to take that statistic and include it. Uh, make sure it gets included in uh, in 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 the materials. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so um, next, the paper, the middle of the paper is going to focus on the overview of each of the options. Um, this list isn't exhaustive, but what I wanted to do was highlight angel investment, um, which typically happens before venture capitalists um, come in. And so they tend to um, donate, or not donate, excuse me, they tend to invest um, a fair amount, but of course it's not as much as a venture capitalist would. Um, they do it at earlier stages. And um, they're definitely, their contracting is a little more informal um, just because they don't wanna be so caught, like so um, contractually tied to the business that is very difficult for the VCs to then come in because the VCs need more contracting provisions. So angel investors typically do informal contracts or contracting that's kind of standard versus a venture capitalist. So then the paper will move on to overview venture capitalism, um, its success rate, benefits and cons, um, and then like what stage they typically invest and what kind of businesses they're looking for. Then um, Brittany's presentation actually did a really good job of this, so I won't spend long on it, um, especially because I thought I was going to have to explain this. So that's great that Brittany already handled this. But um, businesses actually have incubators and um, accelerators. And then also colleges, of course, have incubators and accelerators as well. 
Um, one of the um, universities that I highlighted for the college incubators was Stanford because Stanford's program, oh my God, they've mixed incubator and accelerator together and they offer them capital um, all in one. So they see them all the way through probably about like year three. So their program is very impressive. Um, but for businesses, they also adopt smaller businesses um, and then allow them to get, they also give them the opportunity to grow as well with the same resources. But depending on the type of program, like Brittany mentioned, if it's an incubator, then they're just gonna give them the resources. Whereas with accelerator, it's gonna be more about the funding Funding and already funding an already existing idea. Um, then I want to go into convert, convertible securities, which this is a very large sum of equity funding options for businesses. Um, so for this, it's mainly it can come in two forms. It can be in debt or um, in equity, but either way, you originally buy it in its original form and then it converts to actual equity in the company. And so depending on which one the company chooses, you set the price um, and then you set the uh, call option. So, and the call option is just allowing you to buy it before it actually converts. Um, and then what it'll do um, if you do the debt option, then it allows you to do um, a lower premium, like, I mean, excuse me, a lower interest rate than an actual loan. So if there is a black owned business um, or a minority business that can't, you know, afford the interest rate of an institutional lender, then they could offer this to investors to get a lower interest rate so they don't have to pay as much, right? So um, this is actually a really good option for smaller companies in general, but especially for people that don't have the credit scores to be. Let me just let me just add uh, something there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you're investing in a risky venture, you're providing the money. You're probably going to want to do it through a convertible security that is debt, but can convert assuming the business takes off in the equity. Mm -hmm. So if the business doesn't go forward, if it doesn't succeed, you've got a debt instrument, which means that you're gonna get paid before anybody else gets paid. Right. Before any equity owner gets paid. But you have the right to convert it into in this in the common stock. So you get the you'll get the the, the benefit. So it has it has downside protection and upside potential. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just mention, while probably most convertible debt instruments have an interest rate associated with the debt, and as you said, Skylar, that interest rate is gonna be lower than the interest rate on a straight debt instrument because you got the benefit of the upside in the convert. So the fact that the, the conversion is there is going to make the interest rate lower on the debt. Now, one of the things I just wanted to mention, keep this in mind. When you're planning one of these, one of these things and you're using a convertible debt security, think about a zero coupon bond. A zero coupon bond is a bond that doesn't pay interest on a current basis, but the amount of the interest is taken care of when the bond is ultimately paid. So it, 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 it reduces the amount of, in, of, of cash that the company has to pay to service the debt until at a later point when hopefully the company is successful and can pay off the, the, the debt, which is going to be um, a, a significant portion of it is going to be what's known as original issued discount. The, because the interest rate is reflected in the difference between the amount that, the, that, that is paid at the time the debt is, becomes a payable and the amount that the, the company receives in, in, in the initial loan. There's a big gap between those two, the amount that, of the loan and the, and the redemption price of the security, and that gap is the original issue discount. Wow, I'm glad you explained it because I promise you, I thought that they had to pay at least the interest. I know they didn't have to pay back the loan. Okay. The well, it depends on the contract. Ah, it depends on the contract. The contract can say pay interest on a current basis. And I'm simply saying, yes, you can put that in the contract, but think about the possibility if you don't want to, if you don't, if you're in a situation 
where you aren't sure you're going to have the interest to pay on a current basis, mm -hmm. consider using a zero coupon bond. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to include that in my paper. I'm glad you said that. Thank you. If you want uh, some want some information on on zero coupon bonds, I can send you a discussion from one of my books that will lay out the basic rules. I don't know that you need to go into great detail, but you may just want to. Yeah, wanna just to yeah to get that overview. Yeah, I definitely I will email you after class because I definitely do want that. Good. Um, and oh, okay. So um, equity funding. I mean, uh, equity crowdfunding. So there are two types of crowdfunding, um, but what the paper is going to focus on is the equity crowdfunding, in which you can get angel investors um, and venture capitalists to um, invest in your company, but in smaller amounts, um, where they won't need as much information. Um, so now the SEC is allowing this to happen and even greater, this can happen online. So I list a couple of online places um, that founders can go to, to actually reach out to these investors um, and submit term sheets and all that um, that they need. But this is providing great access to founders that don't, that aren't um, in close um, proximity to investors or don't have the network to know where investors may be. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to focus on in incentive stock options and non-qualified stock options, which I believe Nicole's um, presentation did a great job on this. Um, but basically, if the founder does not have the money to, ha to hire the human capital that they need to be successful, they can use these stock options to actually lure people in. So that way you're not paying, you know, technically, let's say, if you steal someone from you know google or whatever i mean they're asking price is probably going to be a 500k salary a black owned business does not have 500k to spend on their salary but if their idea is good enough and the person that they're stealing believes in their idea enough then they will be willing to take a share or percentage of that company um in equity to make up for the 500k that they can't afford so that way they wouldn't have to pay them as much they still got to pay them but not as much so i wanted to discuss that equity option as well and then um, I want to also go into some of the necessary documentation for equity funding because it is a little bit more strenuous than debt financing. Um, so one of the things which we've already uh, we already talked about in another person's presentation um, in the past couple of weeks, but they definitely need a thorough business plan. Um, and then on top of that, they will need a PPM um, to kind of go over, okay, this is what my business is about. This is where we see us going, but then also the terms for the stock options that are, excuse me, the stocks that they're offering um, and then the risk of investment. So they have to be transparent in these um, documents. And then next, um, before they begin or before they actually think about equity funding, they need to establish if there are more than one founder, if there is more than one founder, they need to establish a co-founder agreement so that they can figure out how much equity are we keeping for ourselves and how much are we going to give out? Because what they don't want to do is run out of equity by series B or C. Um, and they definitely don't want to run out or they definitely don't want to give away so much of their equity that they're now minority shareholders and they have no power in their own company. So this is very important for them to allocate ahead of time before they reach out to any investor. Um, then also they'll need their venture capitalist um, contracts, especially if they do decide to go with a VC. And this consists of four main contracts, which is the stock purchase agreement, uh, certificate of designation, shareholder agreement, and registration rights agreement. Um, and the paper will go into each of those and some of the provisions that they can um, that they can use to, to kind of protect themselves, um, but then also that are favorable to the investor as well. Um, and then um, the employee contract. So if they do do the incentive um, stock-based options or the um, non-qualified stock options, then they will need to make sure that these are correctly written in the employee contracts. And finally, they'll need a valuation of their shares of which they need to um, make sure that they have this in their PPM, their business plan, um, and then also their, their subsequent contracts for that as well. All of this will require a lawyer, which is where you all come in, right? Um, if you decide to do business law, this is not something that they should try to do by themselves. Um, maybe possibly the first the business plan, but other than that, everything else on this list, they need a lawyer. Um, and so it's very key that we uh, educate ourselves on this. So this paper will work for lawyers as well in this industry. And then finally, um, the paper will end with highlighting the contractual provisions that I've been talking about. Um, there are necessary provisions that 
no contract should go without, especially if, if they are um, asking for equity funding. So they have to know like the vesting terms, they have to know when will the full uh, amount of the stock be available to the investors. Um, and they'll also need to know liquidation preference. So that's important because you definitely don't want a situation where you um, incorrectly write this provision and give a venture capitalist the right to liquidate your entire company without your approval, right? Um, especially because venture capitalists, the way they're set up, they're meant to get fast results as quickly as they can. And so their idea is if they know that you're not going to make it IPO, then their idea is, okay, how can we liquidate? How can we um, get this acquisition as quickly as possible? So you want to make sure that you protect yourself or make sure that the founder, sorry, not you, the founder protects themselves appropriately with preferences, like, I mean, provisions like this. Okay. Um, and also with respect to the liquidation preference, you're going to see that in, in, for example, common stock, I mean, preferred stock, that's going to say if the company is liquidated, the preferred stock will be paid before the common stock. It have a preference over the common stock at a certain amount. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, I'm taking this. Sorry. Um, and then also, I wanted to note the anti delusion protection. That's an, another important thing. You definitely don't want um, them to have the power over when to dilute your own company or to make sure that you, your stocks are protected enough so that people can't buy so many stocks that your stocks don't matter. I mean, your shares won't matter anymore. Um, and then voting rights, especially as when equity funding is involved, um, they're going to want to say on the board. So you will need to kind of uh, make sure that the founders understand, um, you know, how much power you're willing to give away, how much, how much of the percentage of the votes that you're willing to give away um, to your founder. I mean, excuse me, to your investors. Um, and then, lastly, I wanted to focus on because I realized the scholarship didn't talk about these as much, but some defensive provisions. And so, like a poison pill that kind of prevents hostile takeovers. Um, right of first refusal, so it prevents the um, investor from selling the shares without at least offering you the opportunity to buy the shares. Okay, uh, 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 Morgan, let me just, I mean, uh, Scott, let me just mention, with respect to poison pills, you're only going to see a poison pill in the, I mean, you could see them in the context of a small, closely held company, but you probably aren't. They're mm -hmm. going to be, they're going to be present in, could be present in a situation where you had a publicly held company. But mm. not necessarily, but not generally a private, privately held company. There's only one case that I'm aware aware of that that has involved a, a poison pill in a private company. And the private company was a company that all you guys have heard about, eBay. Oh, hmm. did not know that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take that out. <laughs> um, so then. Um... What was the other? Oh, discretionary um, stock redemption. So if the investor, like a lot of times I was reading an article where it said VCs kind of promise all these great things that come with their money, um, especially like non-financial services, like marketing strategies and accountant, all these great things. But because they stage their investment uh, by like the second or third stage, they kind of, um, they kind of like eliminate a lot of these promises. Um, because they're informal and a lot of times they're not written in the contract. So to kind of protect the founder um, and make sure that they actually get the promises that were promised to them, um, they can also, if they find that the investor isn't, you know, holding up their end of the bargain, then they can redeem the stocks that the investor purchased um, and, and make sure that they get their money back and then they can go and shop for another VC if they have the bargaining power to be able to do this because some founders probably are too scared to do this. But this is an option for them, especially if they don't like where the investor is going um, with their company ideas because they'll be sitting on the board and they'll have more power. But if they don't like where they see that the investor is only about money or doesn't really care about their idea, they can just buy back their shares um, and then just <laughs> tell them thank you so much for investing in us, but have a great day. Um, so there are a lot of protections that they can use. Um, and investors also have protections like negative covenants um, and demand registration rights, um, which when I did my research on the registration rights, um, a lot of people did not suggest demand registration rights. Um, yes, because it forces a company to, um, to go public before the founders actually choose to go public. So a lot of them prefer piggyback on registration rights. But either way, like investors can sneak these provisions in if the founders don't know any better. So the idea of the paper overall is just to provide an overview of what these provisions could mean with before they actually hire a lawyer, right? But then they still have to hire a lawyer <laughs> because these are very tricky. So that is the end of my presentation. 
Okay. Questions for Skylar. Very interesting, Skylar. That was a very good uh, overview of a lot of those corporate issues that you're going to clearly be um, be um, be dealing with. Okay. Now, Sydney's up. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, it's six. It's five fifty-two. I I have put together some notes that I'd like to run past you guys. Can we plan to go to like six fifteen or six twenty? Is that I, have to, I have to leave at six. Me too, okay. Sam. I have to leave at six. I'm going to try to rush through this in the next seven minutes. Oh, okay. Um, but if you have feedback for me, can you please send it to me? Um, I'll appreciate it. I'm just trying to make my screen big. What about the what about uh, the others? Can you hang around for ten minutes? Where is present? I can. Yeah, that's fine. If you can, I'd appreciate it. Hmm. Okay, Sydney, you're up. Yeah, I don't see where the button is for me to go into presentation mode. Does anyone see it or no? Yeah, yeah at the bottom, that little like where it says comments and then there's a book and there's four bubbles. The one right beside the book. Oh yeah. Sorry, your pictures were covering that. I couldn't okay. see. <laughs> All right. So so this paper will explore an analysis of how intellectual property law contributes to the wealth gap between white and minority businesses. And um, we kind of already went over the gap between um, uh, the between minority and white families in regards to like media income. And so this slide was just showing basically what that gap is, but we've kind of covered it in proximity to what is the poverty rate. Um, so one of the major barriers between closing this gap is generational wealth. And my paper focuses on how IP law has contributed to uh, Black and women not receiving generational wealth, which is contributing to this uh, wealth gap. Okay, so the hypothesis is IP law has contributed to the wealth gap between white and minority businesses by hindering the attainment of generational wealth and not catering to Afrocentric methods of creativity. What is IP law? Um, we covered this a few weeks ago, but basically it's uh, trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights, patents. It's federal protections that the government affords to certain persons who apply for them um, that covers various types of protections, which I will cover throughout this presentation. Okay, so um, the Lehman Act was established in 1946 and this act pretty much set up what is now known as our um, trademark uh, system um, in the registry. Um, and there are two uh, foundational requirements for this uh, trademark protections. And that is that it must be in the use in commerce and it needs to be distinctive. In addition, the Lehman Act prohibits registration of trademarks that are scandalous or disparaging in nature. So this was interpreted for a long time to mean that you couldn't trademark something that was uh, racially offensive. However, in a recent Supreme Court case, which we will explore later, um, the Supreme Court kind of said that is not the case, that is unconstitutional. All right, so how does trademark law contribute to the uh, creating the wealth gap between white and minority businesses? This is supposed to be a little interactive, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> speed it up. Basically, um, so trademark law protects identities in the marketplace by prohibiting third parties from using identifiers such as symbols or names that associate with a particular provider. And so some of the racist trademarks that we, most of us know about um, are the Redskins, the Washington Redskins and Jemima. And I'm not gonna say the one at the top, but basically it's the N-word hair, long cut tobacco. Um, these are actually products that have been trade, well, um, have been trademarked and are protected. Um, and one of the professors that I use throughout my paper, Professor KJ Green, he hypothesizes that the use of stereotypes and these derogatory trademarks is contributing to um, the subordination of Black people, which in turn is hindering Black people from establishing business relationship, et cetera. So when you think about um, things that we've explored earlier about Black people not receiving loans at a higher uh, frequency, not being able to establish certain business relationships, the reason why is racism, right? And where does racism come from? Stereotypes. And now you have the federal government since 1945, I think I said, since 1945, basically protecting people to uh, 
advertise their uh, racist uh, trademarks. Okay, so Aunt Jemima is the primary example I use in my paper. And the reason why is Aunt Jemima is over 130 years old. For years, it has been um, deemed as a racist brand. However, um, families throughout America for generations have used this brand and not even um, consciously um, realized that they were uh, participating in the promotion of a, a derogatory stereotype of African-American women. Um, so Aunt Jemima is a byproduct of the Mammy character, which I'm um, derived out of the Jim Crow enslavement area, um, era in which uh, it shows black women as being tyrants, as um, caretakers and so, um, domestic workers of white people. And so um, recently in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd and this awakening from corporations, uh, Aunt Jemima via Quaker Oats Company came out with a statement of saying, we realize that our brand um, trademark is racist. So we're gonna remove this trademark from shelves after 130 years, they just realized that. Okay, so talked about the origin. All right, so on to this um, court case in 2017 that I, I mentioned. So about 20, for about 25 years, the um, Washington Redskins, now called the Washington football team, has been trying to get their uh, team name trademarked, but they've been receiving a lot of opposition from um, indigenous groups, basically saying you can't trademark the term Redskins because that's offensive. That's a derogatory uh, saying. Now this band called the Slants wanted to trademark their band name and uh, the trademark registry basically said, no, you can't, that's a racist um, terminology to use. Um, the Supreme Court in a unanimous decision stated that the clause that I mentioned before in the Lehman Act that said you can't necessarily trademark things that are derogatory is in violation of the First Amendment. Um, so based on that ruling, the Supreme Court has basically limited the options for solutions on how do we, um, get rid of this uh, opportunity for businesses to trademark racial stereotypes that lead to the subordination of Black people. And so then um, I go into solutions and those solutions are very limited. Like I said, you can't pack the court because we had liberal justice like RBG, um, Sotomayor, Kagan all decided, agreed that, you know, you can trademark these racial, um, racially offensive trademarks with no problem. Um, that's not an option. Trying to amend the constitution to change the first amendment and its protections truly is an option. The only real option is what we saw with the Washington Redskins who have changed their name, even though they have, they legally didn't have to. And Aunt Jemima is by social media and the public um, having massive outcries and boycotting um, racially offensive products that um, to the point that it seems taboo to trademark those things. Okay, next we look at copyright law and how it aids in creating the wealth gap between white and minority businesses. Copyright law basically gives creators the sole right to reproduce their creations. And if you want to use their creations, you have to buy a license. So what does this look like? How is this um, beneficial or not beneficial to necessarily uh, Black people, Black artists. So for a long time in early U.S. history, a lot of the works by Black artists, blues artists during the 1920s and 1930s, 19, all the way up until the 1950s, were put into the public domain. When a work is put in the public domain, you cannot license it. That means anyone can use it. They don't have to pay a fee for it. So this has caused um, a generational a, a gap between attainment of generational wealth for um, black artists which has transcended itself into, into modern day versus white artists of the time were able to um, not have their works put into the public domain and um, be able to attain that generational wealth. What I've recently learned is that um, due to amendments to the Copyright Act I think of 1976 um, now works are automatically copyrighted if you uh, produce an original work and now it's um, it's up to the person who wants to use that work to show that this is something that should not have been copyrighted. But before then, 1976, that wasn't the case. So then I give the example of um, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton has an infamous song, I Will Always Love You, popularized really by um, Whitney Houston. But prior to that, Elvis Presley went to Dolly Parton and said, hey, I want to record your, your song. Dolly said, of course. Elvis said, I want 50% of the publishings, basically 50% ownership of the song. Dolly Parton said, absolutely not which was very beneficial on her behalf because every time this song is played in movies, et cetera, she gets a publishing fee. Elvis does not um, at all in regards to the actual work of art, which is quite different from black artists during that same era and that same time who felt compelled due to a lack of generational wealth to have their works recorded by more popularized artists. Okay, so 
There are five copyright structures that create a disadvantage for the production from uh, uh, for black culture. Um, and the first one that Professor Green talks about is that the copyright structure mandates that what you want to copyright has um, receive protections for it has to be a raw idea and not the expression of ideas. And so Professor Green says that um, an example that is like hip hop music. Hip hop music is at one point, it could have been considered the expression of ideas, but now it's the raw idea because it's been used so much that it's the foundation of other of other works. So it can no longer be considered the actual um, uh, uh, expression of ideas, but it's the raw idea. So for that reason, it's limited amounts of persons who have exceedingly um, benefited from the foundation of the creation of hip hop. So when you have, um, I, I listed the artists, uh, the, the founders of hip hop music. They're not benefiting as much as some of these other artists, such as um, Sean Combs and Sean Carter, as well as Dr. Dre. Okay, another re barrier, the copyright structure requires that um, it be fixed. Uh, something that is tangible and a lot of black culture is oral so that's a hindrance next um, copyright structure basically gives low standards of originality which allows um, for imitations hopefully you all get the cultural reference in this video on this slide it is um, a lot of people said that taylor swift imitated beyonce's performance from coachella and then little richard is known for saying he is the originator of rock and roll and a lot of people imitate off of him copyright does not protect those persons from those types of imitation Next. Okay, finally, the fourth disadvantage is the formalities of copyright. So for a long time, um, person who were not, persons who were not literate struggled to understand the rules of copyright law, which is still um, plausible today, um, although there's more resources in order to assist people in becoming literate in copyright law. And then lastly, there is a general, a general absence of moral right protection, which um, protects against harms to a thorough dig dignity. Solutions. What are the solutions? So I had a few solutions that I examined in paper. Um, I'll just give you one of the, the major solutions is basically allowing for raw ideas such as genres to be able to be copyrighted versus not just allowing the expressions of those. One of the backs, um, backdrops of that is like if we copyright genres, then will be people be able to afford to still make music? Will that stifle innovation? The answer to that is no. Just like Dolly Parton's song, I Will Always Love You has been re-recorded by numerous artists and she getting publishing fees from that. Um, as long as you have an equitable structure of um, how those licenses will, will happen, um, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, okay. And finally, we get into patents. Um, patents allow for creators to, um, to prevent others from making or selling their creations. And the example I use here is Cardi B and um, the founder, Christian Louis Vuitton. Um, Cardi has a song about red bottoms. She cannot uh, then in her, I don't know, moving forward, she can't say, well, now I'm going to sell red bottoms because I, uh, I made the, the shoe brand popular. No, um, red bottom has, um, Louis Vuitton has a, um, has a patent. So only they can choose who sells their products and um, the creation of their products. Okay. So um, Patent applications are, um, there is a, uh, a shortage of patents being um, brought forth by black and women, by black persons and women. Um, in addition, black, black people and women have their patent applications approved at a lower rate than white applicants. A recent study um, done showed that persons with female names are more likely to get their applications denied than persons with masculine names. And they actually did an empirical study where they gave tester names, um, like fake names, and um, their their, those applications were being denied at a higher rate. And the um, authors of that article implied that this is probably due to a bias about women and their abilities um, to have a great work to be patented. And so a solution is to remove names from applications and instead have persons have numbers. So kind of like we do with our exams. And then that would have been into a question section. I really, I apologize for talking so quickly, um, but thank you. <laughs> You know, I, I learned so much from your from your paper and that presentation. Uh, stuff that I had no idea was um, was uh, was happening. So I, I just want to thank you for that. Any questions for Sydney? Okay, Sydney, excellent. Let me just say this 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 set of presentations is just off the charts, ladies. Uh, just off the charts. Um, so uh, here's what I would like to do for those of you who can stay, in around, stay around for about 10 minutes. 
I want to run something past you that I've been working on. Uh, and I started working on this um, when I was a uh, law student. And I'm going to start working on it now. Um, so can you share, can you see my, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, let me go here. Okay. So uh, quickly, uh, my 1971 Minority Business Development course at the Pennsylvania Law School uh, was a course in which I gave my presentation just as you're giving your presentation, but my presentation was 50 years ago. And the course, the, the, my topic was Black Ownership and Analysis and a Proposal. And I was able to get it published in something called the Black Business Digest. And it was serialized because the damn thing was so long, serialized into four different issues. And it was published from November, December 71 to February 72. Now, I had lost, uh, lost copies of, of several of the, um, the issues. And I just got the most important one, part four, this morning or this afternoon about one o'clock. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, by the way, my professor, Bob Munheim, participated in our special session of the course last week. He's the guy I wrote the paper for. So first thing I want to do is I want to compare some of the stuff I say about the gaps between blacks and whites in 1971 with what uh, we're, what you guys and I have been saying here in 2021, 50 years. Okay, unemployment among blacks is generally about twice that of whites. So let's look at, that's in 1971. 2021, unemployment among blacks, 10%, among whites, 5.9%. So it's shrunk a little bit, but not significantly. Number two, there's a 37% tax on the income of Blacks. While they represent 11% of the labor force, they only receive 7% of the income. So the tax is 37%. You work as hard, but you get paid um, at, a, at a rate of 70, in essence, 73% of, uh, of, of each dollar that's going to a white person. That's what's going to a Black person. Let's look at it today. Median household income of whites is 65,000, and that of blacks is 41,000. There is a 37, i.e., yes, a 37% tax on the income of blacks, while the median household income of blacks is 41.5%. The median for whites is 65.9%. Okay, now let's go to a measure of wealth. Saving the savings accounts. It's not a complete me measure of wealth, but let's look at saving accounts. Back in 1971, I pointed out that the average balance in saving accounts of whites was 4.4K. The average for blacks was $824. Thus, for this uh, uh, indication of wealth, black wealth was 18% of white wealth. Now, if you look at if you look at uh, savings accounts today, black wealth is 25% of white wealth. So the gap is closed by seven percentage points. However, when you look at broader measures of wealth, the gap is really still there. So from 1971 to, to 2021, 50 damn years, there hasn't been a lot of progress on this issue at all. Now, um, I, I really want to read this because this is Leon Sullivan, who is a uh, who was a black minister in Philadelphia. He owned he he formed something called OIC, uh, which was designed to help blacks and other minorities get uh, jobs. He was also so he was a, a a big time minister in Philly. And he was also a member of the GM board of directors. And he had a quote 
that I that I included in my article and I picked it up here today because I I have completely forgotten I included it. But I think it was it, it was really uh, prescient. As every football enthusiast knows, the game is won or lost between the twenty yard line. When the play is near midfield, it is not too difficult to make spectacular runs and complete ten yard passes. The opposing line is loose and the defending secretary is secondary is all spread out. But when the ball gets inside the 20 yard line, the real game begins. The opposing line stiffens. The defending secondary tightens itself and becomes more alert. Down there is where it is hardest to move the ball inside the 20 yard line. That is the situation now. He's talking about 1971, as far as the civil rights movement is concerned. The demonstrations, the sit-ins, the wait-ins, the selective patronage programs, and the marches were the spectacular plays. They produced great results. We have come as far as we have as a result of them. The long runs have been made, and they have been spectacularly important. Now, though, we come to the 20-yard line. Now we must move the ball economically. He said that in 1960, and it is so applicable today, and it's really the reason that we have this course. So now, what do I propose in this in the in the course for dealing with this issue? I I propose the formation of something called the National Development Corporation and the National Development Bank, and I'm going to quickly outline what the uh, how these would work and i would appreciate if if anyone could hang around and give me some comments i would love to hear them because i'm going to be redoing this article uh the purpose would be to make a profit while helping a brother now by the way the focus here was on uh the economic development of blacks uh at the time there weren't a lot of Hispanics in this country, and frankly, I didn't address Hispanics. I focused on, 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 on blacks. Today, and I, obviously, I would focus on, on uh, Hispanics as well as Asians and other possible minorities. There would be two constraints on all investment decisions under the National Development Corporation. The investment must be profitable, profitability, and the investment must pro promote the welfare of disadvantaged people, and I call that benefit uh, benefitability. The first step in organizing the National Development Corporation is for 500 Black leaders throughout the country to agree to become the initial shareholders, to provide the seed capital. The National De De Development Company would be organized with Class A and Class B stock, the Class A having the voting control and the Class B having a vote but no control. Key point. Only black churches and other religious organizations could be holders of the class A. So for example, uh, uh, the Nation of Islam uh, religious facilities could be owners of, of class A. The purchase of stock by religious organizations would be funded by contributions from the parishioner. Anyone including white churches or individuals could hold class B stock. The initial 400 black leaders who provided the funding, the initial funding, would exchange their initial stock for Class B stock. Uh, now, in 1971, it would not have been hard to raise enough capital to have NDC become one of the top 500 firms when measured by shareholders' capital. So, in other words, through the polluting, uh, pooling of capital through these churches and other religious organizations would have permitted the company to be come one of the top 500 companies in the country. Now let's turn to the National Development Bank. It would also have uh, the, the goal of making a profit by, while helping a brother. There would be two constraints on all bank lending, profitability and benefit, benefitability. Like the organization of the National Business uh, uh, Development Corporation, the first step in organizing the National Development Bank is for the 4,000 4, 4, Black leaders throughout the country to agree to become shareholders. And then we have a similar thing with Class A stock being owned by Black churches and other religious organizations 
Class B owned by anyone. Both would have voting, but the but the Class A vote would predominate. So you would keep control of the company forever in the hands of black churches. And again, in 1971, uh, it would have been possible through the National Development Bank for the company to have uh, to be in the top 50 of banks in the country measured by shareholder capital. So those, those, those are my thoughts and my proposals for this National Development Bank and National Development Corporation. And I think it's something that I'm going to try to spend some time on and try to get uh, get it going, figure out how to get it going. I would really appreciate any thoughts or comments uh, you might have. Uh, is this Does this seem like a good idea, a bad idea? What do you think? Quickly before substantive things, I'm not sure if you're asking in terms of like grammatical issues of the... No, I'm talking about substance. Okay, okay, carry on. I just put this together this afternoon, so I'm sure there are a whole bunch of grammatical mistakes in it, but I'm just talking about the substance. Um, so um, actually, I think, I think this would be a really good idea. Um, I was wondering, how would you feel about also opening up Series A to um, nonprofit leaders as well? I hadn't thought of that. That's a that's a good suggestion. Now I'll, I'll think about it. Especially like the larger national ones like NAACP and stuff, because um, because granted, you're right, like the church leaders definitely, especially these mega churches, um, has allowed them to collect money like in an unprecedented scale. Um and ironically, um, places like Transformation Church, which is like completely online now, um, they actually grew tremendously during COVID when churches were closed because they can now reach a much larger audience. So yeah, I think churches are a really good start, um, but then also opening up to nonprofit leaders too, um, that are huge in the black community. It'll, it'll be like core and all of that. So yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a good suggestion. I hadn't thought about that. That's a great suggestion, Skylar. I echo those same things. I was gonna ask, um, I may have meant, missed this because I stepped away to use the restroom, but why? What's the focus on the Black church for? What made you lean toward the Black church? Because it is uh, the largest uh, Black uh, organization uh, in the country. As they say, America is segregated at most on Sunday morning. <laughs> um, and, uh, I've, and also, I, I felt it would be a way to reach so damn many people and you could collect funds uh, from a whole bunch of people in small amounts. And um, um, so that's, that's, um, that's the, the reason I came up with this idea of, of using the black church. You know, and, and one of the things, you know, this occurred to me back uh, a couple of years ago, I had my son down in, uh, in Mississippi for a basketball tournament and I was driving to, to driving him to Atlanta. We we're going to fly back and we stopped in Montgomery, Alabama, which is the capital of Alabama. And I went to Martin Luther King's church. And to my surprise, his church is literally about 300 yards from the capital of Alabama. Um, so so you have this black church right here in the heart of uh, uh, in the heart of Alabama, right close to the to the capital of Alabama. So I mean, the black church is sort of ubiquitous, uh, and it is. Uh, I think it would be uh, a good place to raise to raise the to raise to raise funds. Obviously, you know, selling people on the idea would be uh, would be a difficult challenge, but I think that if the idea could be sold, uh, blacks would have an opportunity to build a significant uh, business uh, organization 
that could help to close the gap. And uh, uh, the, so it ne wouldn't necessarily be closing the gap on an individual by individual basis, but because the parishioners of the churches would have an economic interest in the in the corporation, it would be you. It would be increasing the the collective wealth of of blacks rather than the individual wealth. And I, I don't consider this to be sort of the the silver bullet, uh, but I think that it could be something that uh, that could help in closing the wealth gap. So um, not to talk about tax, but okay, tax, right? So if they were to sign on to be shareholders, is their investment considered a gift and then the tax is a gift or will they still be protected under their nonprofit statuses? I think, I think churches are protected, right? Like they don't have to pay taxes. Yeah, you got you 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 hit on you hit on uh, uh, a major issue here, and I I didn't deal with it when I first put the put it together. I was aware of the issue, but I didn't I didn't deal with it when I first put the paper together, and I haven't felt I haven't dealt with it yet. But it's something I'm going to have to deal with, and that is <clears throat> is there a way of structuring this so the organization could be a tax exempt organization? Right. Uh, and then also, uh, there's some rules that prohibit churches from um, from having something called unrelated business income. And I frankly don't understand what the rules are, the unrelated business income rules. But you're absolutely right, Scott. Are there tax? There, are, there are obviously tax issues associated with the uh, with the uh, with the idea. So uh, I would have to look into that, but I think that I think that there would be no. I mean, it, the, I think the basic question would be: Is the company going to be a, a tax-paying entity, or is it possible to structure it so it would be a tax-free entity? Right. And if it were possible to structure it as a tax-free entity, that could save it a lot of money. And because it's it's got this it's got this quasi-public uh, function. Uh, with it, um, if it if it could be structured as tax as a tax exempt entity, uh, it would be obviously more beneficial because it would be more capital there to service uh, the community. Now, by the way, the service of the community would would be um, would come in the form of plowing plowing uh, uh, profits back into expanding the business and developing things that would end up employing uh, Blacks and other minorities. Mm. And then I guess my last thing, um, I just wanted to know, how then do you prevent um, the argument of, of uh, uh, church and like avoiding uh, um, the mix of church and state? So like, will there be limits on how much these businesses have to, you know, abide by these faith-based, um, like, um, ethical rules? Like, are, is, are we talking Chick-fil-A ethical rules, where if I'm taking your money, you got to do what I say, or um, will there be a limit on that for the business owners? Uh, I, I hadn't thought of the Chick-fil-A thing, um, but I would, but I would want it, I would want it to be, uh, I would want there to be uh, something in the documents that would make it um, so it wasn't religious. So I see, I see, I see this as being uh, as using the churches as a way of building a company that that you know I, that's going to not be going to be. Is going to have the goal of dealing with the economic condition of black folks and other minorities, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to have a religious function to it. Okay, cool. What do you think? I just think that you would definitely need to make sure that that is addressed because I think that's like 
quietly in the back of like the new generation's mind. Yep. It will yep. Happen. yep, 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 good point. Any other thoughts? Okay, well, I certainly do appreciate you guys hanging around. I appreciate your being in the class this semester. I really enjoyed um, working with you all. And I've enjoyed your presentations today. And I just want to thank you for it.